Tonight on the eve of the high stakes NATO summit, Canada promises more troops to deter Russian aggression. The Prime Minister's pledge. We are going to more than double our presence. Still years away as leaders of the powerful military group gather to plan their next moves. The popular energy drink backed by influencers prompting safety concerns. More than double the caffeine of Red Bull. The push to investigate Prime for marketing to young consumers. A normal teenager should not need that much caffeine ever. Plus, a Canadian cyclist's major milestone. The sky's the limit if you've got big dreams and uh, good legs. Taking a top prize at the Tour de France. It's a Canadian who has conquered the mythical mountain. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. It is now early morning in Lithuania, where in just a few hours, representatives from the world's largest military alliance will meet to refresh their action plan against Russian aggression. Currently, NATO has 40,000 troops it can rapidly deploy, bolstering that number to 300,000, a key item on the agenda. Today, Prime Minister Trudeau was in neighboring Latvia, where he revealed it will take another three years to double the size of Canada's troop contribution. CTV's Kevin Gallagher is traveling with the Prime Minister ahead of the critical summit. The Prime Minister visited Canadian troops in Latvia, only 200 kilometers away from the Russian border, as Justin Trudeau promised a stronger force there to deter Kremlin aggression. Canada is double, uh, up to doubling uh, its presence in troops here, and we know uh, that our partners and allies across Europe uh, will be uh, increasing their presence as well. This could mean increasing the number of Canadian Armed Forces members at Camp Adagi from 800 to 2,000. National balance. As Canada looks to live up to a promise made at last year's NATO summit to grow the Latvian battle group to a brigade for approximately 3,000 troops. If Canada want us, wants to stay in a leadership position, they need to continue to add combat capabilities to their battle group. Canada won't reach its brigade level promise in Latvia until 2026, a pace that puts it behind many allies leading similar NATO battle groups. The UK has already conducted brigade level drills with its group in Estonia, and Germany is prepared to send 4,000 troops to Lithuania on short notice, though permanent facilities are a few years away. I think we can expect to see that our troops will be there uh, for quite some time, probably beyond three years. As Kyiv fights a costly counteroffensive, pressure is building for countries like Canada to increase defense spending. Canada will invest $2.6 billion over the next three years to increase its military presence in Central and Eastern Europe. $1.2 billion of that is new funding. But Ottawa is still far from meeting the NATO goal of spending 2% of GDP on defense. This is going to be a big question and mark for Canada. Are they really committed to NATO? or are they only going to do half measures? So I think Canada is going to be put on the spot here. The Prime Minister has pointed to Canada donating more than a billion dollars in military aid to Ukraine, its NATO contributions in Latvia, and a recent $19 billion purchase of F-35 stealth fighter jets as proof that Canada is committed to security. We feel very strongly uh, that Ukraine uh, should be joining NATO as soon as conditions allow. Discussions of Ukrainian membership and providing more arms to the front lines will be top priorities as members search for a unified approach at the NATO summit. Omar? Kevin Gallagher in the Lithuanian capital tonight. Kevin, thanks. Sweden is now poised to be NATO's newest member after Turkey lifted its objections today. Completing Sweden's accession to NATO is an historic step that benefits the security of all NATO allies at this critical time. Turkey had said Sweden needed to crack down on Kurdish militants and anti-Islam protests, but the support also came with an ask. The Turkish president called on European nations to help his country join the EU. 
Some unexpected news from the Kremlin tonight. Moscow says Vladimir Putin met with mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin five days after he led an armed revolt. The Kremlin says the head of the Wagner Group pledged his support for Putin. His current whereabouts are not known. And on his way to the NATO summit, Joe Biden had his first meeting with King Charles since his coronation. The king seemed unfazed when the U.S. president put his hand on his back, breaking protocol. Biden also met with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. And here at home, a startling drive-by shooting in Toronto's downtown core early this morning sent two people to hospital with gunshot wounds. Police believe road rage and street racing may have sparked the gunfire, which comes just days after a mother was killed in broad daylight. Here's CTV's Adrian Gobriel. Jarring eyewitness video captures the moment police arrive at the scene of another brazen blast of gunfire on Toronto's streets. All the people around where they were just uh, running to save themselves. A woman's shoe and multiple shell casings marked the spot where the bullets began to fly shortly after 6 a.m., sending two to the hospital, just steps from a major downtown intersection. I heard gunshots. I woke up because of it. There was a lot of blood. A concerning case of road rage may be to blame, according to police. Officers also responded to a call with regards to stunt driving and occupants of the vehicles involved in this stunt driving call were also in front of 7 Charles Street at the time of this shooting incident. Got it Many Toronto residents are already on edge following a lunch hour shooting on Friday in a neighborhood full of families. A stray bullet struck and killed an innocent mother of two. Hopefully we remember that Toronto's just been ranked, I think, number fourth uh, safest uh, city in North America. While police work to temper growing anxiety, the continued flow of illegal firearms into the country are responsible for the majority of Canada's street-level violence, according to a former gang leader. What we know is that the majority of them are coming in from the U.S. Anti-gun advocate Marcel Wilson used to run a notorious Toronto gang. He believes the federal government's ban on the sale and importation of legal handguns is missing the mark. It may have some effect in, uh, with different forms of violence, femicide, um, maybe even in suicide in some cases, but when it comes to gang violence, when it comes to random violence that we're seeing in the streets, uh, it'll have little to no impact. As for this latest shooting, investigators are short on suspect details. All we know is that they're looking for a black SUV that was seen fleeing westbound along this downtown side street. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. The former USA Gymnastics doctor convicted of sexually abusing female gymnasts is now recovering after being stabbed multiple times in a Florida federal prison. Larry Nasser was attacked in the back, neck and chest by another inmate and was seriously injured with a collapsed lung. Nasser is serving a decades-long sentence. British Columbia has banned nearly all campfires across the province after worsening drought conditions. The drought situation is serious. We have not experienced this level of widespread drought across the province this earlier in the year, uh, this early in the year in recent memory. 23,000 lightning strikes over the past three days have sparked more than 100 new wildfires. And high temperatures are making it even more challenging to gain the upper hand on the flames. In the U.S. tonight, 9 million Americans are under a flood alert after torrential rains battered parts of the Northeast. The fierce storm, described as a once in a thousand year event, has killed at least one person in New York State and forced many from their homes. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malvin has the latest. <gasps> Look at the people's doors! It came fast and furious, intense storms moving like a tidal wave dropping more than a month's worth of rain in parts of New York and Vermont. It is up to my knees. Causing historic flooding across New England, search and rescue crews pulling dozens of people trapped in their homes and in their cars to safety. Backyards turned into waterfalls. Cars were washed away. Well, I didn't want my car to swim away. And roads collapsed. It was extremely scary. I have never seen anything like this. In one of the worst hit areas, New York's Orange County, a young woman trying to evacuate tragically was swept away by the torrent of water. She crossed with a, with a pet and lost her footing and unfortunately was washed away down into a ravine. 
maturing the damage, New York's governor warning of more climate disasters to come. My friends, this is the new normal. And we in government, working with our partners on the ground, have to work with our communities to build up resiliency, to be prepared for the worst because the worst continues to happen. Happening in Vermont, this one in a thousand year weather event is soaking the state. This is an all hands on deck response. We have not seen rain fall like this since Irene and in some places it will surpass even that. Not since Hurricane Irene 12 years ago has Vermont been at such high risk for flooding. Some areas completely cut off, overwhelmed by water. Weather is weather. It's going to happen. Uh, rainfall, uh, flooding events are going to happen. What climate change is doing is it, it's supercharging them. And the rain? It still hasn't stopped. As experts predict these extreme weather events from the floods, the fires and heat happen more and more often. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. A worrying new picture tonight of the financial burden Canadians are carrying and the anxiety it's creating as higher interest rates and the cost of living stretch budgets. The snapshot comes just days before the Bank of Canada's next rate decision. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin reports. On the menu in grocery store aisles right across Canada, plenty of talk about bills adding up. It's outrageous. Uh, you know, it's hardly, hardly able to make ends meet with the price of food. The cost of living, higher interest rates have stretched more than half of Canadians' budgets to near the breaking point. According to a survey by insolvency firm MNP, 52% are $200 away from not being able to meet financial obligations. That's up 6% from last quarter. More than a third already can't cover their bills and debt payments. We've been doing this for five years. Uh, we've never seen numbers like this. And it's not just food eating away at Canadians' wallets. The price tag of essential items is up right across the board. Canadians report an average increase of $230 in their weekly spending. And those who most regret taking on the debt they have are millennials from the ages of about 27 to 42 years old. It's a generation hit particularly hard by the cost of housing and mortgage rates that could go up again this week. If the Bank of Canada, for example, raise rates again this Wednesday, uh, it will be the highest uh, level in 30 years. Uh, so for a lot of Canadians, it's, uh, it's a very tough financial situation to be in. Part of the balancing act as the Bank of Canada continues to try to keep inflation in check. A separate survey also released today found 15% of Canadians are cutting back on retirement savings, while one-third are preparing for a possible recession by building up savings. Sometimes they buy two, three packages. At Esposito's, a family-run business serving consumers for more than 60 years, they say good deals fly off the shelves quicker than ever. They have to eat, eh? And we see a lot of people that come every day to shop and looking for prices to go down and all that. Looking for a bargain, increasingly part of the shopping experience. Geneviève Bosch, my CTV News, Montreal. Talks between two Canadian newspaper giants have fallen apart. Post Media, which owns the National Post, among other papers, and Nordstar, which owns the Toronto Star, say that in the end they weren't able to agree on the terms of a potential merger. The negotiations were revealed late last month. Protesters demanding a search for their loved ones at a Manitoba landfill are standing their ground tonight, despite an ultimatum from city officials to break up a blockade that began last week. The standoff unfolding against the backdrop of a meeting between premiers and Indigenous leaders in Winnipeg. CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Joe Makishan reports. Just before the noon deadline to dismantle this camp, another barricade went up. Since last Thursday, this group, made up of families and friends of the Indigenous women murdered and dumped in the trash last year, has cut off main road access to Winnipeg's landfill. Look at how many people are standing behind us today. And who is nowhere to be seen? The city, our premier. They're the ones who ordered to have this blockade down, and where are they? Four women are believed disposed of in Manitoba landfills. The remains of Mercedes Myron, Morgan Harris, and an unidentified woman called Buffalo Woman have never been found. Alleged serial killer Jeremy Skibicki has been charged with their murders. Searching for the women could cost more than $180 million. The federal government is reviewing a feasibility study. Manitoba's premier has said she will not support it, citing health and safety concerns. 
This is a prime example of the things that we're still having to fight for when it comes to our people and when it comes to our women. The protest comes the same week Canada's premiers are meeting in Winnipeg, today sitting down with Indigenous leaders. Our women deserve more. We don't belong. We're not garbage. The protesters also came to the meeting location uninvited with a message. Search the landfills. Manitoba's premier defended the decision again. A toxic and hazardous waste that are in the landfill and the likelihood and probability of, of finding, you know, um, the, body, the bodies of, of those individuals who, who perished. The city of Winnipeg had issued an order last week to vacate the landfill site. Now officials are looking at an injunction to legally force the group to leave. Jill Mackishon, CTV News, Winnipeg. Coming up after the break. I wouldn't suggest that kids have these kinds of drinks. New questions about an energy drink backed by influencers targeting teenagers. Plus, a young Canadian accused of vandalizing a temple in Japan. An energy drink popular with millions of kids and teens is raising red flags for some doctors and now lawmakers for its potentially dangerous levels of caffeine. Created by social media stars, Prime is already banned in some schools in the UK and Australia, and now the US Food Administration has been asked to investigate. CTV's Heather Butts reports. Uh -oh. Advertised as the perfect boost for any endeavor, Prime Energy Drink is the latest sports beverage creating a fan frenzy, but now it's also drawing tough criticism. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling on the FDA to investigate Prime, which he believes is aimed at kids and contains caffeine amounts equivalent to about six cans of Coke or two Red Bulls. Buyer and parents beware because it's a serious health concern for the kids it so feverishly targets. The Prime label is an influencer-backed brand founded by YouTube sensations KSI and Logan Paul. We want Prime. We That's want social Prime. media clout leading to a massive launch last year, with kids racing to get their hands on a bottle. The drink comes in two forms. Hydration, which is caffeine-free in a plastic bottle and easily found in Canadian stores, and the energy version, which comes in a can with vibrant packaging. It's the energy drink that's causing concern. A 12-ounce can of Coke has 34 milligrams of caffeine. A cup of coffee, 135 milligrams. A 12-ounce can of Prime Energy, 200 milligrams. It's not widely sold here. The can does exceed Health Canada's limit of 180 milligrams of caffeine for a single serving energy drink. We certainly know it can increase the risk of anxiety and stress, poor sleep, poor appetite, and definitely can predispose kids to having more behavioral issues, more irritability. Dr. Dina Kulik says kids under 12 shouldn't have any caffeine. Those older, no more than 100 milligrams. Health Canada recommends adults don't exceed 400 milligrams per day. In a statement, the company says it complied with all FDA guidelines and welcomes discussion with the agency or any other organization to protect consumers. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. A wild scene in Long Beach, California, where the pilot of a small plane survived a dramatic crash. The single-engine aircraft slammed nose first into an airport hangar. Incredibly, the pilot was taken to hospital with only minor injuries. Officials say the plane was practicing takeoffs and landings when it went down. Still ahead, the queen of pop breaks her silence. Madonna's first public comments after an infection scare that put her in hospital. A Canadian teen accused of carving a name into a pillar at a Japanese temple that was built 1,200 years ago has been questioned by local police who have opened an investigation but are not detaining the 17-year-old. The Tosho Daiji Kondo Temple in Nara, 45 minutes south of Kyoto, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The alleged act of vandalism comes on the heels of a similar incident last month on the walls of Rome's 2,000-year-old Colosseum. South Africa's biggest city woke up to something they haven't seen in more than a decade. It's something that doesn't happen like each and every time. It's, it's, it's just amazing. 
This is what it looked like in Johannesburg, a city that last saw snow like this in 2012. For some, it was the first time seeing the flakes, stunned and delighted by the rare occurrence. And some good news for fans of Madonna. After the pop star released an update for the first time since being hospitalized with a serious bacterial infection last month. The Queen of Pop posted this message, saying she was on the road to recovery and keeping focus on her health and getting stronger. She also said her plan is to reschedule the North American leg of her tour and begin in Europe in October. No word on new dates, though. The celebration tour was supposed to kick off in Vancouver this week. After the break. It was a really nice sensation. It was awesome. A Canadian's magnificent ride at the Tour de France. Today was a rest day at the prestigious Tour de France. More time for cycling sensation Michael Woods to let his incredible achievement sink in. The 36-year-old who grew up in Ottawa became only the third Canadian to win a stage in the grueling competition. Here's CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver. Michael Wood is on a mission. Heading into the final stretch, Michael Woods was behind, but more determined than ever to close the gap on his competitor and a lifelong dream. And now he's going to go past Michael Woods. An all-out attack with just 500 metres to go in a 182-kilometre cycling race. Yes, he knows he has it. I gave a thumbs up to the camera because I knew I, I got it, and I was super excited. And uh, on the radio, I could hear, hear the, the guys yelling and screaming and uh, it was a really nice sensation. It was awesome. He's grimacing. Woods is grit helping him climb to victory. It's a Canadian who has conquered the mythical mountain. On the ninth stage of the 21-day Tour de France. Certainly a relief. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself and I really wanted to get a stage win. Uh, it's been kind of a career goal, life goal. Woods only picked up cycling in his mid-20s after an injury sidelined him from his first professional sport, running. If you wanted to race him, good luck. <laughs> Ray Elric coached Woods as a teenager and always knew he would do big things. He was talented, that's the main thing, and he, uh, he had a heart of a lion. I mean, he was just a bear out there. If you wanted to race against him, be prepared to hurt. <laughs> A sentiment shared by longtime friend Luke Maller, who first suggested Woods enter a cycling race. No idea what he was doing. Always showed up with grease all over him, like he'd wrestled the bike the whole way. And you'd ask him, he's like, oh, I just pulled it out of the garage. With one tour victory now behind him. Uh, yeah, that was not easy, my man. Woods wants more wins and is vowing to continue putting the pedal to the metal. The sky's the limit if you've got big dreams and uh, good legs. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. And that's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.